Well, good morning, students at Spring Lake Village. Boy, it is sure cold this morning. The uh, temperature has uh, really dropped. Uh, so we're going to be uh, wrapping up our five-part lecture series on contested uh, elections. Um, as you know, we uh, had to continue the series into the first two uh, weeks of November. So this week's lecture is entitled uh, The Stolen Election of uh, 1876, uh, which was dubbed in the aftermath, the fraud of the century. And you'll see very shortly why it was given um, that term, the fraud of the century. So let's begin then with our final lecture in this series, The Stolen Election of 1876. So in the summer of that year, the United States was celebrating the centennial of the Declaration of Independence, our uh, freedom from uh, Great Britain. And although it was a, a jubilee year, the American Republic was deeply troubled. The uh, desperate battles of the Civil War may have ended, you know, a decade before, but yet Abraham Lincoln's call for malice towards none remained an un, uh, unfulfilled appeal as federal troops continued to occupy some of the states of the uh, former uh, Confederacy. And uh, there were other uh, problems on the horizon as well uh, during that heady time. It was a very uh, troubled period uh, for America. And we do find a country uh, uh, deeply divided on the eve of the election of 1876. Now, the Republican Party would remain in firm control of the presidency and federal government for nearly a decade uh, following the end of the uh, Civil War um, in 1865. Due to the uh, presence of uh, federal troops and officials in positions of power, Grant was able to carry eight Southern states for the Republican Party in the presidential election of 1868. And he won a second term in 1872, but this time only six Southern states were in the Republican camp. In addition, um, the grip of radical Republican power uh, was fading. More significant, uh, the immediate post-war zeal in the North for African-American welfare was beginning to uh, diminish. Nonetheless, um, the so-called Republican radical reconstructionists had been so successful in reshaping the political landscape in the old Confederacy with uh, the installation of biracial governments. This is the great heyday of enfranchised former African American slaves who, for the first time, exercised real political uh, clout. And um, the Republican Party, the radical Republicans in particular, had been uh, very successful in uh, this political reality in the old Confederate South. But then the political fortunes of the Republicans would turn with the uh, outbreak of the so-called Panic of 1873. Now, the Panic of 1873, for all intents and purposes, was, in fact, a Great Depression, the first great economic downturn. There were other, two or three previously, but this one was very severe. It actually uh, began in Europe, uh, in Austria, when the Viennese market uh, crashed in June of uh, 1873, and soon unsettled markets would spread to Berlin and throughout the whole of Europe. And then it arrived uh, some three months later in uh, the United States when major banks uh, stopped making payments. Um, 
One in particular, the Philadelphia Bank of J. Cook and Company uh, went bankrupt, and that really precipitated this enormous uh, run on banks. Um, it in turn led to uh, widespread unemployment, and especially in the South, uh, uh, many farmers uh, went bankrupt uh, when they saw um, plummeting uh, plummeting prices for many of their uh, most important crops like tobacco in company um, just uh, went downward uh, very, very quickly. In addition, um, there were a number of protests, um, especially among the labor unions who were crying out for help from the uh, federal uh, government. Uh, the most um, famous uh, uprising took place in the streets of New York City in the following year in January of 1874. Um, a huge riot that ended up being quashed uh, when federal troops uh, were called in. It was a really sort of bloody affair and uh, it did much to sort of slow down the uh, labor movement in the United States um, for a number of years. So um, this sort of uh, period of economic unrest, um, really gripped the nation as both Democrats and Republicans sought efforts um, on the federal level to address the uh, growing economic uh, catastrophe. In addition to that, uh, the Grant administration was beset by a number of scandals. Um, one of the most egregious involved the so-called um, Credit Mobilier of America, which uh, was a sort of dummy construction um, company that had been granted a contract under um, sort of nefarious means. Uh, and its, uh, its contract called them to build the Union uh, Pacific uh, Railroad, but it was in fact being financed by uh, fraudulent uh, bonds. Now the um, Grant administration was uh, also reeling under a barrage of attack by the press when a great whiskey scandal uh, broke out. And um, in uh, this particular scandal, Western distillers had been flag flagrantly um, evading uh, federal tra taxes. And um, we discover that Grant's own private secretary, General Babcock, Babcock was um, implicated in the uh, whiskey uh, scandal. Grant's enemies gleefully pointed to corruption in the White House. And Grant, um, instead of disassociating himself from back Babcock, um, instead, instead he would um, leap to his defense. Um, um, we actually find Grant displaying an almost uh, incredible loyalty um, to dubious players and uh, colleagues um, during um, his administration. So um, the press was uh, really uh, un attacking uh, the Grant uh, administration and uh, really uh, more and more destroying uh, Republican chances of uh, victory in the election of uh, 1876. Here you can see this is uh, a number of uh, political cartoons. This one in uh, Harper Weekly, you see, uh, you know, you see the gymnast uh, Grant trying to you know, uh, straddle between these two rings because he's, uh, you know, he's got multiple scandals now that have uh, erupted. And, um, you know, this is just one of many political cartoons, social satire um, attacking um, his scandal, scandal ridden uh, administration. Now this engraving that you see here um, depicts the uh, panic of 1873 
Uh, and this, in fact, uh, is the labor union unrest um, that took place in the streets of New York in uh, January of uh, 1874. So now in the lead up to the election of uh, 1876, um, we find uh, both the Republican and Democratic parties um, trying to address the economic uh, downturn. And um, the Republicans now um, were sort of abandoning uh, a lot of their uh, reconstruction uh, efforts. Uh, the radical Republicans uh, no longer had their grip on power that they had enjoyed in the years immediately after uh, the Civil War. So um, it put uh, Re Reconstruction sort of on the defensive uh, within the ranks of the uh, political, uh, within the ranks of the Republican Party, as they uh, their imperative was to tried to come up with a policy that would uh, that would address the uh, economic uh, crisis. The biggest threat to Republican to the Republicans, however, as well as um, enfranchised uh, African Americans was the amount of violence uh, and intimidation that was taking place at the hands of the uh, Southern Democrats. This also was the period that saw the rise of the first uh, manifestation of the Ku Klux Klan that was effectively the paramilitary of the uh, Southern Democrats, especially in um, the recon, uh, Reconstruction states. There was, however, a splinter group of the Democrats. Um, these were called the New Departure Democrats, um, also known as the Redeemers. And um, they uh, were in support of the rights of Blacks, their voting rights. And uh, they called for uh, advancements um, for African Americans during a uh, the later Reconstruction uh, period. And um, they were trying to come up with um, new economic policies to uh, address the uh, Great Depression that was severely affecting uh, African Americans and poor white uh, farmers um, in the South. You can see here, um, in the left-hand corner, um, this is an engraving from a uh, Harper's Weekly. It shows a, a poor uh, black voter in the middle of uh, two pistol-wielding uh, white Democrats who are, um, you know, uh, intimidating, intimidating uh, this African American. The caption reads, "Of course, he wants to vote uh, the Democratic uh, ticket." So, uh, in 1874. For the first time since the Civil War, the uh, New Departure Democrats in particular were successful in the Democrats overall, overall, overall in retaking control of the House of Representatives in the uh, midterm elections of uh, 1874. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, the United States is about to celebrate the 100th anniversary of its uh, independence. Um, meanwhile, uh, Grant's administration didn't have the wherewithal now to intervene in the South due to rising national hostility to interference in Southern affairs in the presence of uh, federal troops. Already in uh, 1875, a major conflagration uh, had erupted in Mississippi, and uh, the Republican governor of Mississippi had urged uh, federal involvement, but to not. In the meantime, um, the newly elected uh, governor of Ohio, Rutherford B. Hayes had been victorious, um, not 
uh, without a platform that included uh, reconstruction uh, policies. Instead, uh, so you sort of see him disassociating himself from the uh, Grant administration that was uh, riddled with scandal. That's why he was calling for good government, honest government, um, coming up with his own plot platform to uh, resurrect the economy, and um, even uh, temperance. Um, he was part of the uh, temperance uh, movement. So as I mentioned, um, Abraham Lincoln's uh, dream of malice toward none uh, was not being realized, especially as we find federal troops in a number of the former states of the uh, Confederacy. And of course, as you see, um, these other uh, scandals, the whiskey scandal, et cetera, were really um, eviscerating uh, the administration of uh, Ulysses S. Grant during his second term. So as you can see, the political fortunes of the Republican Party were not looking um, particularly good. Um, there were many who wanted uh, Grant, who was still rather popular, believe it or not, um, in the United States. Um, there were some who thought he should run for a third term, but already as tradition had dictated going all the way back to the days of uh, George Washington, um, it was unprecedented uh, for a president to run for a third term. And in the end, uh, Grant decided he would not run for a third term. So the Republicans would meet in the middle of June in 1876 in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, and the strongest contender for the nomination was James Blaine of Maine, who at that time was the um, Speaker of the House of Representatives. So despite the popularity, um, you know, he was, um, it looked like he would um, clinch, uh, clinch uh, the uh, nomination, but on the first ballot, um, he was just a uh, hundred votes uh, shy of uh, of the majority. Recognizing that uh, public attention had to be focused on something other than the administration's record, Blaine attacked the South and stirred up fears of a new war. But in doing so, he alienated those members of his party who had sought a genuine rapprochement with the old Confederacy. It wasn't until the seventh ballot that, uh, that uh, members of the party uh, finally nominated a dark horse candidate, and that was Rutherford B. Hayes, of course, the uh, reform-minded governor of the state of uh, Ohio, he would emerge victorious uh, with a vote of 384 votes to James Blaine's uh, 351. And as his vice president, uh, as his vice presidential running mate, uh, the convention selected William A. Wheeler, uh, a congressman from uh, New York. Now, Rutherford B. Hayes was a compromise between the extreme wings of the Republican Party. Above all, his personal record and political integrity could not be um, seriously uh, challenged. Uh, Hayes uh, was 53 years of age, um, born in Ohio in the town of uh, Delaware. He had been uh, raised by his uh, widowed mother who was uh, very financially uh, secure. She came from a, a privileged uh, background. Rutherford uh, went on to uh, Harvard Law School where he obtained his uh, degree in uh, 1845. And um, afterwards, um, he uh, was involved in a number of fugitive uh, slave cases. And during the Civil War, he rose to the rank of Brevet Major General of Volunteers and participated in a number of uh, actions and uh, actually had been um, 
severely uh, wounded. In accepting the nomination for the Republican Party, Hayes vowed to end the spoil the spoils system, which had uh, run amok during the Grant administration, and had called for an end to this distinction between North and South in our common country, as he called it. So this conciliatory statement was very much in sharp contrast to resolution number 16 of the Republican Party platform, which went so far as to question the loyalty of the Democratic majority in the House of Representatives. This allegation reflected the presence of congressmen who had fought for the Confederacy itself. Uh, in early July, the Democrats would hold their uh, convention in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. This was actually the first time that any national <coughs> convention or any, uh, national political party would um, hold its convention uh, west of the uh, Mississippi River. And at that convention uh, in St. Louis, um, the delegates went on to nominate um, the governor of New York, uh, Samuel J. Tilden. Um, he had quite a bit of support from the delegations of various states uh, in the South. And Tilden himself was kind of a unique figure, um, certainly one of the most interesting individuals to uh, cross the American uh, political scene. If you looked at him, he certainly didn't look like a robust, strong uh, candidate um, who could lead the uh, Democrat Party. Um, he was frail, not very uh, charismatic, um, a bachelor, but he did command this almost crusader-like zeal from his supporters. Even as a boy, little Samuel was uh, withdrawn, very distant, um, he didn't uh, know how to play with his friends. Um, what interested him most of all and uh, his was politics, um, which was uh, piqued by, uh, by one of his uh, relatives. He was very interested in uh, economics and uh, political theory. At the age of 15, he uh, saved up his money to buy uh, Adam Smith's uh, Wealth of Nations, which had been published in uh, 1776. In 1841, he was a lawyer um, whose interest in politics uh, only uh, grew. Uh, it was his brilliant grasp um, and his cunning in political matters that brought him to the attention of democratic leaders who often sought his counsel. For some time, uh, Samuel Tilden had strenuous, strenuously avoided candidacy for high public office, but his own abilities soon brought him to uh, national recognition. Um, one of the uh, most important events that brought him to fame, fame was his exposure and prosecution of New York's notorious racketeer, uh, boss William Tweed. After that, his uh, popularity soared and um, he was in fact elected uh, governor uh, of New York. So he was exactly um, what the Democratic Party wanted, this uh, moral upright man to go up against um, the corrupt uh, Republican uh, administration. They uh, chose as his uh, running mate for vice president, the governor of uh, Indiana, Thomas uh, Hendricks, uh, right on the uh, first uh, ballot. <clears throat> so the battle lines um, were uh, clearly uh, drawn uh, once um, campaigning uh, finally commenced in the uh, fall of uh, 1876. 
So um, let's briefly examine um, the political platforms of uh, each of the parties. So as I mentioned, um, <clears throat> the Republicans now, their platform uh, wasn't any longer uh, built on sort of re reconstruction um, ideals and uh, policies that had been featured in their previous platforms all the way since the uh, end of the uh, Civil War. Nonetheless, within the, uh, Demo the Republican platform, they did articulate some of the more noble, noblest ideals of support for the newly enfranchised African American, uh, African Americans, the former slaves of the South. So the Republican platform clearly stated the permanent pacification of the Southern section of the Union and the complete protection of all its citizens in the free enjoyment of all their rights are duties to which the Republican Party is sacredly pledged. Moreover, the platform went out to decry the Democratic Party for um, its uh, lack of commitment to advancing civil rights for African uh, Americans. Although the Redeemers, as I mentioned, um, that new branch of the Democratic Party um, had uh, tried to voice support um, for the civil rights of uh, former slaves. The Democrat uh, platform, on the other hand, uh, its central feature, of course, was uh, the end of corruption. So they eviscerated in their platform the widespread uh, scandals that had um, taken place during the administration, especially during Grant's um, second in an administration. They called for an end to the rapacity of carpetbag uh, tyrannies in the uh, Old South. So they saw themselves as the reformers, uh, pure as the uh, white driven snow who would once and for all bring an end to the uh, rapaciousness, to the dirty politics, to the spoil system of the uh, Grant administration. Other um, parts of the uh, Democrat platform, however, um, called for uh, the protection of naturalized uh, US citizens um, who went back visiting their homelands. It also called for um, curtailing of immigration of uh, Chinese Americans, of course, who were um, who had been brought in to uh, work on uh, the railroad, the Union Pacific uh, Railroad and uh, other infrastructure projects um, in the West. And as I mentioned, a uh, civil service reform, also a uh, tariff uh, reform. Um, some would argue that Tilden's nomination because of his sterling reputation received more enthusiasm for any Democratic leader since uh, Andy um, Jackson. So um, left to themselves, it is possible that Hayes and Tilden might have kept the election free from distortion of facts and bitter personal invective but it was not to be. Sadly, Samuel Tilden was subjected to a number of damaging charges. He was literally eviscerated by the opposition. There seemed to be no limit to the accusations. So he was labeled a liar, a swindler, a perjurer, perjurer a counterfeiter, Even the absurd claim that he had been in league with the infamous Boss Tweed. 
in line with their basic uh, campaign strategy, the Republicans even alleged that Tilden had supported the Confederacy, the right of secession, and the continuation of uh, slavery throughout the South. This all stemmed, however, from his opposition to Lincoln in 1860. But that was because, of course, he was a Democrat and he feared that a Republican victory would bring a disaster to the US. And uh, this feeling had no bearing, however, on his fundamental loyalty to the Union. Like Lincoln, he believed uh, that the Union should be held together. And once the uh, Civil War actually broke out, he urged the quick suppression of the election, of the uh, quick suppression, I should say, of the, uh, of the Confederacy. So as election day quickly approached, um, excitement was growing with each rally uh, and parade. It was, as I mentioned uh, earlier, the 100th anniversary of America's uh, independence from Great Britain. Even uh, politically apathetic citizens were coming out for Hayes or Tilden with um, great enthusiasm. But on polling day, November 7th, calm prevailed as people uh, made their way to the various uh, voting centers, the various voting polls. So on uh, the evening of the election, on the uh, 7th of uh, November, Rutherford Hayes um, saw rather early um, that his political fortunes uh, were fading uh, rather quickly. Uh, his hopes really began to sink as swing states, such as uh, Connecticut and Indiana and New Jersey went to Tilden. And when New York finally fell into Tilden's camp, Hayes admitted defeat to those around him and uh, went to bed. At this point, uh, Tilden had more than a quarter of a million votes, uh, and he had 184 of the far more important electoral votes to Rutherford Hayes is uh, 166. So with 184 electoral votes, he was just one vote short of uh, capturing um, the uh, presidency. Meanwhile, um, the reconstructed states of South Carolina, Louisiana, and Florida, which represented nine electoral votes were still being um, contested. They had not yet um, been declared. And of course, they were in the heartland of the Democratic South. So at the Republican National Headquarters, exhausted and dispirited party workers um, began to go home. And um, a plan now was afoot in which the Republicans would find a way to grab those 19 electoral votes, again, from Louisiana, Florida, and South Carolina, as well as one contested elector from the state of Oregon. Now, one of the most powerful, if, if not the most powerful newspaper in the country, the militantly Republican New York Times on the evening of November 2nd even conceded the election uh, to, uh, to Tilden. And the New York Times, however, would do no more than admit now that the Democrats probably would lead. But then two days later, something remarkable took place when the influential editor of the New York Times, John C. Reed, sat in the editorial room alongside two of his most trusted 
assistance. It was now the morning of November 10th, three o'clock, when a message arrived from the State Democratic Committee. Please give your estimate of the electoral votes secured by Tilden. Please answer at once. Reed was astounded. If they urgently needed such information, then perhaps the Democrats were not certain of victory. So in a matter of minutes, both Reed and his army of advisors now conceived of a scheme to wrest the election away from Tilden and put Rutherford Hayes in the White House. Now, Tilden had 18 more electoral votes than Hayes, but again, if those 19 votes from South Carolina, Louisiana, and Florida were secured by the Republicans, then Hayes would win by one vote, 185 to 184. At this point, the disputed uh, elector from Oregon had now um, been given um, to Hayes. So now there really was a pathway to victory. So um, the Republican Party had control over the canvas canvassing boards, and they went ahead and declared that the votes, the electoral count in those contested state, states were irregular. And on a recount, many of Tilden's votes were in fact disqualified for unspecified reasons. Um, there were a number that were uh, put forward by the canvassing boards. Now the Democrats truly believed that the Republicans were filling out uh, fake ballots and stuffing them in the ballot boxes and claiming there were places where the number of votes actually exceeded the population. And that was certainly the case um, in Florida, uh, where in fact, the number of votes did in fact exceed the population of those particular uh, counties. Perhaps um, the most uh, egregious um, act committed uh, was an attempt by uh, Republican controlled election boards uh, to offer a $1 million bribe um, that Louisiana's votes would go to the Democrats. So there was an attempt by the Republican Party to blackmail uh, the slate of electors for Louisiana, um, but they rejected um, that offer. And in the end, Hayes, with just one electoral vote to spare, was declared the victor. So here's the uh, electoral map of the final uh, vote in the uh, electoral college. Blue for Tilden, he had 184 electoral votes to Hayes's 185, uh, the rose-colored um, state. So Hayes would win by a mere one electoral vote. So let's um, look a little bit more at the uh, shenanigans uh, that took place in these uh, contested states um, and why this election would be called the fraud of the century. So Florida's key electoral votes um, in the end went to Hayes. The Republican governor certified them with the official blessing of the state. The outraged Democrats held a meeting and had the Attorney General certify the Tilden electors. With this action, a new and dangerous complication now entered the scene. Democrats claiming dishonesty by the canvassing boards were certifying their own electors by whatever legal or quasi-legal means they could. 
And to further complicate matters, Florida Democrats elected J.F. Drew as governor, and he would appoint a new board of canvassers who promptly judge Tilden's electors to be victorious. Meanwhile, in South Carolina, where Wade Hampton had been elected governor, there were unqualified demands to disenfranchise the Hayes electors. As a precaution, President Grant ordered federal troops into all three, all three of the state capitals of the disputed states and directed none other than General Sherman to see that proper and legal boards of canvassers went unmolested in the performance of their duties. That meant Hayes would win. At this point, Samuel Tilden's followers almost begged him to adapt, to denounce the plot publicly, but he would do nothing to, pre to prejudice the uh, legal process. This is somewhat difficult to understand in view of his previous anti-fraud successes. So it was, uh, I guess you could say, an unthinkable uh, prospect when all three of the contested states, again, uh, Louisiana, Florida, and South Carolina, went on and submitted two sets of electoral ballots. Fortunately, there were men of influence on both sides in Congress who saw that a peaceful solution was absolutely essential. So on December 14th, the House of Representatives would appoint a committee to approach the Senate in the hope that a tribunal be, could be created, one in which they stated, whose authority none can question and whose decision all will accept as final. So after much debate, an electoral commission was approved. Congress proceeded to set up a group of uh, 15 men, so five senators, five justices uh, from the Supreme Court, and uh, five members of the uh, House of Representatives. Presumably, the court justices would be uh, nonpartisan. Both Hayes and Tilden declared the commission unconstitutional when it convened in January of 1877, but they reluctantly agreed to accept its verdict. It was clear to everyone what would happen without the commission. Republican Senator Thomas Ferry of Michigan presiding over the Senate would open the certificates before a joint session and declare Hayes the winner by 184 by 185 to 184 electoral votes. The House would then immediately adjourn to its own chambers where the Speaker would declare no electoral majority and throw the election into a vote by each state delegation in the House. That would assure Tilden's victory. And on March 4th, 1877, both Hayes and Tilden would be in Washington to be inaugurated as president of the United States. So we find the commission holding its first session just four weeks before the inauguration. Democratic members of the commission pressed for a searching examination of the honesty of the canvassing boards. The commission finally voted along party lines with the decision going to Hayes with Joseph P. Bradley, the Supreme Court Justice, emerging as the uh, swing vote. So uh, Hayes emerges triumphant uh, with a final tally of 185 to 180 votes. That was the electoral count. And again, the Democrats cried foul, calling this the fraud of the century. Now, at that time, um, the
the Constitution required a president to be named by early March of 1877. That was the situation at that time. Now, of course, um, presidents are sworn in on the 20th of January, the January following the election. The Democrats um, uh, threatened a, a filibuster, which in fact would have delayed the final tabulation and who in fact uh, won. And that was a place where no one wanted to go. It never before happened. So um, the threat of a filibuster on the part of Democrats forced the hand of the Republicans and out of it came the so-called Compromise of 1877, which would call for the removal at long last of uh, federal troops from the South, which had been one of the Democrats' major campaign issues. And the Democrats in turn would drop the threat of a filibuster. This in turn, however, really brought that is the Compromise of 1877, really energized the Southern Democrats who would return to power. So they were on the ascendancy again, as they were um, in earlier years, before the years of uh, Reconstruction. They no longer feared reprisal on the part of federal troops installed in the South. And this then ushered in uh, the horrific era of Jim Crow that uh, saw the persecution, the rise of the Ku Klux Klan, the paramilitary of the Southern white Democrats, and this kind of bigotry and violence um, heaped upon the uh, African Americans in the South all the way through into, right into the uh, 1960s. So although, uh, in the end, uh, we might regard um, this election as perhaps the most contentious uh, in American history. It was not. Um, you can see from our previous lectures, the, the lectures that I presented to you in this series, that um, America was at the tipping point. There were a lot, there were a number of elections that really could have torn this country asunder. Of course, the election of 1860 precipitated the uh, Civil War, and the same could be said um, for uh, what took place during the election of uh, 1876. So next week, uh, we're into the third week of uh, November. It'll be the 20th, and there's only two weeks left. So um, I'm going to take a, a different turn and uh, present uh, a two-part lecture series on uh, a topic I think you might find interesting, um, very intriguing, perhaps a little salacious. And that is we're going to examine the harem the hidden world of the harem during the height of the uh, Ottoman Empire and the enormous power that the women of the harem wielded and how it uh, affected the fate of the Ottoman Empire in its uh, waning years. It's, um, I think you'll enjoy it. Again, it's, uh, it's just going to be uh, for two weeks and uh, then um, we'll be into the uh, month of December when I'll come up with a, a new um, four-part series that uh, I hope you'll enjoy. So look forward to uh, seeing you uh, next week. You take care.